This week, I'm underground in Hungary. As travel restrictions are lifted, we're in Sierra Leone at the first ever Freetown Music Festival in the capital. Simon Calder tackles your questions about getting the best out of travel. And we check out a famous dish in Dallas, barbecue style with Global Gourmet. Sierra Leone, a destination which has long been off the tourist radar despite having some of West Africa's most idyllic beaches, clear blue waters and lush rainforests to explore. The civil war which ravaged much of the country left deep scars, but just as it looked like those were healing, the Ebola virus struck, helping to ensure that Sierra Leone remained a virtual no-go area for tourists. But with no new Ebola cases reported since January, a first ever Freetown Music Festival has just been held to celebrate the Sierra Leone resilience and hopefully the return of much needed tourists. Well, the travel show went along to join in with the party. Everyone, welcome to Freetown Music Festival 2016, right here on Lumley Beach in Freetown, Sierra Leone. It's gonna be amazing. We have two days of live performances, DJs, food, fashion, art, film, and I cannot even think of what else we have because we have everything. I think Sierra Leone is more than ready for this uh, because there's a lot of local talent, there is a lot of talent and there's a lot of um, enthusiasm for this kind of thing. So people love music here, they love dancing, they love celebration. It's just that bringing it all together into something that, is, that really works just hasn't happened before. My mom would tell me stories about how they used to dress up and go out to plays and just listen to live music and all that stuff. But for a while, we kind of lost it because of everything, of course, that's been going on in Sierra Leone. We suffer. We've been kind of distracted. But I think it's a really, I think that this festival is a real treat. And this festival just really kind of just brightens people, people's, you know, lives up for a few days. It's really awesome. had the whole Ebola thing going on and you know we had all the lockdowns and nobody could go anywhere and now lots of weddings going back and forth and that's because a lot of people had to put off their weddings because of Ebola so now we have weddings we have excuses for parties it's like a relief <laughs> more reason to enjoy yourself right I walked around the city today people said oh, I was there it was nice we need to do this more often so this is the first live festival from Freetown itself, from the Ceylonians that's being created, and I think it's going to cause a great impact. I appreciate the count because people keep like moving forward, like yeah. pressing on. No matter what happens, we still want to do this. We're fighting for this, we want to do it. And the spirit is what is helping us.
Live music was not the thing because people were frowning at it. Only for the old people and the people who are like down there. But now people want it. The artists are craving for it. The fans are like rejoicing whenever they see live band. Like, wow. Yeah, it's yeah. like a new thing. I love music because my, I just love music. I don't know why I love it. I just love music. It was fire, pure fire, trust me. It was one in a billion. It happened. That's it. It, it happened. happened. It happened. And Sierra Leone isn't the only country in Africa that hosts music festivals. Here's our pick of some of the best. The MTN Bushfire is a two-day event in Swaziland featuring music, arts and culture from Southern Africa and beyond, offering revelers the ultimate in glamping if you like the great outdoors. Africa Burn in Tankwa Karoo in South Africa is based on the Burning Man Festival in the US and is one of their biggest events. It's now in its 10th year and more than 13,000 regularly attend. The Lake of Stars Festival is an internationally renowned music festival which takes place on the palm fringe shores of Lake Malawi. This year's gig takes place in September over three days. And finally, in Morocco's capital Rabat, the Mawazin Music of the World Festival takes place every May 21st, with international stars as well as homegrown talent performing. The eclectic lineup features Middle Eastern and African artists alongside big names, including this year Marcus Miller and Christina Aguilera. Part of a new series on The Travel Show Now, in which we roam the globe hearing the stories behind some of the world's most iconic dishes. Our global gourmet this week comes from Dallas, Texas, where Justin Fortin has been testing his patience, all in the name of creating the perfect barbecue. There's no shortcut to great barbecue. It takes a long time, and it takes a long time for a reason. Welcome to Pecan Lodge. It's the best barbecue joint in Texas. All right, so what we've got here is a brisket, which is kind of the king of barbecue meats here in Texas. And uh, what we're going to do is get this trimmed up and uh, get it seasoned and get it on the pit. A lot of people ask if the secret to good barbecue is in the rub or if it's in the sauce. And really, that's just a small part of it. Most of the magic happens back in the, in the smokehouse. And it's the pits and the wood and the, the time and attention that we give the meats when they're on there that really give it the quality that we're known for. So we've got these seasoned up, now we're going to take them to the smokehouse and get them on the pit. The brisket's going to cook for anywhere between 15 and 18 hours, and our ribs are going to finish in about six. We're cooking them at a, at a pretty low temperature, 200, 250, and doing that will allow the, the fat and the connective tissue to, to melt away and make the meat really tender. This is really where the magic happens. These pits run 24 hours a day. Uh, we've got, we're here all the time, basically having to put wood on the fire every couple of hours. The fire is indirect. It's not, it's not grilling where you're cooking right over the flame. The fire is on a separate part of the pit. It's just a slow, patient way to cook. If there was a national food of Texas, it would definitely be barbecue. So it started off back in the early days with the, the cowboys and stuff like that, slaughtering cattle on the cattle drives and cooking them over open flames. This was a way to, originally a way to preserve the food uh, through the smoke and everything like that. And it turned into, you know, kind of a cult following that has grown over time. And there you have it, that's what we call the trough.
still to come on The Travel Show. I venture underground in Hungary, exploring the geology that made it the country of spas. And Simon called us here to tackle your questions about getting the best out of travel. This week, advice on some of the best beach locations in Cuba. The Travel Show, your essential guide wherever you're heading. Welcome to the slice of the show that tackles your questions about getting the best out of travel. We're off to Havana's hinterland shortly, but first, with Europe's big football tournament about to kick off and tickets incredibly scarce, a lot of people are wondering about the best way to enjoy the atmosphere during the Euro 2016 finals. My advice, just head for the fan zones, well signposted locations in big cities with giant screens, stages for live entertainment and plenty of food and drink. For neutrals, I think the most convivial choice is the Champ de Mars on the left bank of the Seine in Paris. Edward Mitchell sent a letter from his home in Bournemouth on England's south coast to say, I saw an appealing 40-day cruise advertised for £2,500 based on two people sharing, but when I asked how much it would be for single occupancy, the price didn't merely double, it almost trebled. Why should solo travellers be penalised and are there any ships specifically designed with single cabins? How infuriating, but I'm not surprised at that extraordinary single supplement. The economics of the typical cruise ship are based on 100% occupancy with every cabin filled with the appropriate number of people. So you might imagine that a double cabin to yourself should cost twice as much. But the cruise line also expects to earn money from onboard spend in the bars, shops and on excursions. And to make up for what they see as lost income, they'll add an extra supplement. If you don't like the price, well, some firms offer better deals for very low demand sailings. Next, Claire Ellison from Lancashire in northwest England asks... In November we're going to Cuba. So far we've booked five days in Havana. But where should we visit outside the city? First, hop on the cheap and cheerful ferry that sails across to Casablanca on the east side of Havana's magnificent harbour. Besides outstanding views of the capital, you can walk up to the mightiest fort in the Caribbean, La Fortaleza de San Carlos de la Cabaña. Then pick up a rental car for a road trip to some of the most fascinating locations on the island. First stop, the Zapata Swamp for the greatest intensity of wildlife and a glimpse at how Cuba's original inhabitants lived. Next, Playa Giron is an interesting combination of beach resort and historical site. It's at the head of what's known as the Bay of Pigs, the scene of the failed 1961 invasion shortly after the revolution. Peter and Pauline Sutcliffe from Pontyland in northeast England are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary in style. We plan to travel from Niagara Falls down to New York and wonder what which is the best, most scenic route to travel. Uh, and any good stopovers, please. Upstate New York is a joy to drive through, including the mountains of the Catskills and Adirondacks. There are also three city highlights along the journey to Manhattan. The city of Buffalo on Lake Erie, where you can find some outstanding 20th century architecture. America's most surprising college town, Ithaca, home to both Cornell University and the spectacular Cascadilla Gorge at the heart of the city and the state capital, Albany, with its flamboyant capital building. One final stop, Poughkeepsie, close to the former home of Franklin D. Roosevelt and now a national historic site. I'm always happy to hear from Travel Show viewers. Just email thetravelshow at bbc.com and I'll do my very best to answer your questions. From me, Simon Calder, the global guru, bye for now and see you next time. And to end this week, I'm in Budapest, Hungary's capital, which is often referred to as the city of spas and caves. There are approximately 200 cave systems here and in other parts of the country, but surprisingly, many were only discovered at the beginning of the 20th century.
When you're strolling around Budapest's old cobbled streets, it's hard to imagine that another world lies under your feet. But Budapest is one of the few capitals in the world that has natural caves beneath the city streets, and heading underground here can give you a whole new perspective on the place. There are around 200 caves under the capital, but only a select few, like this one, are available for travellers to come and explore. So, Krista, the cave is here. Go on. Let's do it. My guide today is Peter Adamko, who's a professional caver. Budapest is every caver's dream because uh, the cave is not far away from here. He's also a part of the Hungarian Cave Rescue Service, so I'm in safe hands. You need help? Oops. Oh, it's great. So I, I don't think I have claustrophobia, but I guess I'm going to find out pretty quick. It's, if you have, it will be, we find it quickly, yeah. The Palvolgi cave system was discovered back in 1904 and is one of the most popular with tourists, probably because it's closest to the city centre. Oh, wow. We are standing at the moment in the Pavlov cave system. This is the biggest cave system in Hungary. This is, a, this is not meant for tall people. You can see oh, that. Yeah. <laughs> Why are there so many caves underneath Budapest? Because the side of Buda is a big hill, and this hill is a limestone hill, and the caves are made in limestone. At the moment, the total length is more than 30 km long. I said at the moment because the exploration is uh, doing and going and every day, every week. The cave here in the Buda Hills is one of the longest, but only 500 metres of it can be actually accessed by tourists. The rest of the site is for professional cavers only, as it's too dangerous. And you certainly wouldn't want to get lost down here. You don't have a double tie? I guess I better not be. Wow, that is Just a long pictures. way down. To get a sense of the walkways below, I need to climb okay. deeper into the cave. In fact, 10 metres down on a ladder. Right. Here goes. So you're in the worst position if I fall there, Peter. If you fall down, I will catch you. <laughs> It's certainly beautiful, very quiet, but eerie at the same time. And the great thing about exploring the caves here is you don't need to have previous experience. Tours can be booked with English-speaking guides for groups of more than four, and your ticket price includes all the necessary safety equipment, although you'll need to be relatively fit to keep up. We have, lots of, we have a few accidents in here, and the uh, stretcher, is also can come out from this way. A stretcher? Yeah, a stretcher with the body. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you love about caving? I don't know, I'm going to caving because I can relax in here. You relax in here? Oh, yes, really, I'm relaxed. For me, it's better than the one week on the seashore and doing nothing. <laughs> so you love it here? <laughs> yeah, I, I started the caving when I was a child, four or five years old. And uh, in the time, I was really loved these sports and this group. I'm also doing cave rescuing. The Hungarian Cave Rescue Service is in my family. Exploring caves is definitely not for the faint-hearted. You need to keep your wits about you and make sure you follow your guide's instructions at all times. And those with claustrophobia might be best to stick to the bigger caves. Because of Hungary's geology, you'll find caves like this dotted all over the country. The one I'm heading to now is around three hours by train from Budapest in a place called Tapolka. It's a beautiful small town close to Lake Balato, and I'm told the caves here are really special. This cave system was discovered by accident in 1903. A local stonemason was digging a well, and he didn't find any water, but he did stumble upon this place. The caves here are 15 metres beneath the ground, so the temperature stays a balmy 18 degrees Celsius all year round. One of the special things about this cave is that there's rather a unique way of seeing it. The 
The boat ride lasts for about 30 minutes. I'm told the water down here is incredibly pure and because of that, I'm not even allowed to dip my finger in as it could contaminate the water. Absolutely gorgeous. Once my boat trip is over, I head off on foot to explore the rest of this amazing cave system. Oh. First opened for the public in 1912, and the boat trip was available since 1938. We had more than 150,000 visitors last year, so I think this is the most uh, popular place in the Valatona Flans. What's rather fascinating is that although many of these caves are millions of years old, most of them were only discovered relatively recently, and some still haven't yet been fully explored. And although I've enjoyed my time down here, I think I'll leave that job to the professionals. Well, now I've finished my caving adventure here in Hungary. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for on this week's show. But coming up next week... Henry tries a new experience in Cambodia, where tourists are lending a helping hand to curb poaching in some of the country's national parks. And this ride is getting bumpier and bumpier. It's almost like trying to stay on a fucking bronco. Whoa! So do join us then, if you can. And in the meantime, don't forget, you can catch up with us on social media. And all the details you need for that are on the screen now. But for now, from me and the rest of the Travel Show team here in Hungary, it's goodbye.